Can I say good evening or is it maybe just a little late good afternoon? Hello. Um, welcome to this evening's event. Um, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Sally Dacus and I'm going to be the MC for this evening. Uh, I'm a rural journalist and I've been a journalist, sometimes I like saying a couple of decades, but to truth be told, it's three decades. <laughs> I've been with the ABC's Country Hour and their allied programs, Gardening Australia and Landline, and I've worked across Australia and um, worked here in Tasmania for about 20 years. And so I've had the very good fortune of uh, being able to travel many of the off the beaten tracks through Tasmania in the line of my rural reporting. And uh, much of that has been through the Midlands. And uh, just to set the scene, and I think this is the long view is that when I first came to Tasmania, one of the big environmental debates in terms of farming in the Midlands was dieback. It was a big word, dieback, and it was always the debate about uh, was it possums, was it superphosphate, or was it long-term drought, or at least drought since the 70s? And I don't think you know some people have actually resolved the answer to that. I also recall the day that the Commonwealth Government declared the Tasmanian Midlands one of their national biodiversity hotspots. And I do recall that as being something of a, a mindset change and a recognition. And uh, I also recall reporting on the very ambitious Greening Australia program through the Midlands, which is Australia's largest river restoration project. So all I'm really giving you is an illustration of some of these these issues that have flowed through rural media. And they're very much living uh, issues today. Um, so I'm especially interested in the debate that we're going to have today and the discussion after the three main guests. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping. Um, if you haven't yet discovered, their toilets are immediately up that door and down two flights of stairs, which is where the fire escapes are or the evacuation areas. You can keep going down and out there or just head out the main gates into the car park or around the front of the building. And as a courtesy, can you just check your mobile phones and make sure that they've been switched off? Is anyone into Twitter here? We should have a, a hashtag for tonight's event. Has anyone got a hashtag? It's kind of a long title, but anyway, go for it on Twitter if you've got some quotable quotes. We will be having questions after the main speakers and we have some microphones, so hold your horses. If you think of some burning questions during some of the speakers, please don't hesitate to save them up and we'll come back to them in the discussion afterwards. Um, I'd like now to begin and we're going to start naturally with our welcome to country and I'd like to welcome Rob Anders who's going to give our welcome to country. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> 
Jones. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Mena Jones. Mena is a wildlife ecologist and she's a professor here at the university and she's going to paint the big picture here for what uh, tonight is all about. Thank you, Mena. Thank you. Well, to start at a, a very large scale, we are now living in what's been defined as a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, which means that humans have stepped above the ecosystem of which we are a part to become a super invasive species in which we're having major impacts on the global s systems that act sustain life on Earth. And as human populations continue to grow, and provide, need to provide the world's populations with food, fibre and wood is stretching the capacity of ecosystems to deliver that and causing irrevocable damage. Agriculture has moved away from these ecologically based systems that Rob has been referring to, um, to much more technologically driven practice that seeks uh, to maximise yields but some cost to sustainability. So despite decades of efforts in ecological conservation and restoration and sustainable agriculture, ecosystems continue to degrade. And in Tasmania, we're losing ancient paddock trees, which may be hundreds of years old, which were mature trees when Aboriginal people managed the land prior to Europeans coming to this land. And uh, land clearance, while it has slowed, um, continues, even in areas like the Midlands, which has lost 90% of, uh, sorry, it has 10% of its original woodland cover remaining and only 3% of its native grasslands remaining. So this plenary this evening is the public face of a two-day workshop um, that's been funded by a transdisciplinary grant from the University of Tasmania's uh, College of Sciences and Engineering. And this was the inspiration of Carolyn Muhammad in Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture and myself in School of Natural Sciences. So coming from agriculture and ecology backgrounds. Um, Uh, from after a long flight and his journey here has been sponsored by the Ecological Society of Australia who are holding their annual conference in Launceston next week and they've brought Gary out to Australia and sponsored his flight coming into Hobart so that he could come to this workshop. as our case study. Um, how do we envisage what do healthy and productive landscapes look like? Landscapes that support functional ecosystems, that support native biodiversity, but also support profitable agriculture. And how might we get there a little faster? How can we speed up getting to that uh, more sustainable vision. So to get us thinking tonight, we're going to hear three different perspectives from people who are highly qualified in their respective disciplines. And this will be followed by a panel discussion. Each of us in this room this evening brings to this plenary con conversation a rich knowledge that's based in our own experience and our own disciplinary training. But to move forward, and affect change. We need to listen actively to each other and seek to understand these diverse perspectives. And only then can we try to move forward as a group and transition towards a more sustainable future and perhaps even transform the way that we manage the land. And I think here in Tasmania with 
the devastating history of European impact on the Indigenous population, this university and this state, I think, is sitting in a very good position right now to help rewrite the historical, cultural and environmental story of the origins of Australia and how we got to where we are. And this is, I think, the beginning of a journey, or part way through, but the beginning of this journey of bringing in Aboriginal land management knowledge, Aboriginal agriculture of crops that maybe did not require addition of fertiliser and lots of water, Aboriginal man... Uh, vision for the future. And um, in the words of Charles Massey, who wrote a wonderful book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, that if we can move from this mechanistic thinking about food production towards more regenerative thinking, that we're enablers of the ecosystem rather than dominating the ecosystem, we might have a chance of moving beyond the Anthropocene into what could be called an ecozoic era. Thank you. Organisers for tonight's event. So we're going to have our first speaker now, and um, which of course is Gary Tabor. And uh, as I was getting a few pronunciation guides from Gary, he said, "Oh, please don't read out that long and very impressive CV." He said, "You'll send everybody off to sleep." And besides, you can read it; it's in the program. So rather than do that, I've picked out a few keynote words to whet people's appetites, Gary. So we're going to mention the fact that uh, you're from Bozeman in Montana, um, and I see Louise. Uh, Earwaker was uh, in the audience, not Earwaker, Louise Gilfeder, and I know that you went to Montana was a part of your Churchill Fellowship, didn't you? Yeah, yeah there you go. It was a small world. Well, we we'll might get you uh, to pose a question later on. Um, but just some keynote uh, words was that um, Gary's an Australian-American Fulbright scholar. He got the award in climate change. Other words that leapt out of his CV include the work that he's done in Uganda. Um, there's the word gorilla mentioned in there, Yellowstone to Yukon, conservation medicine, freedom to roam, new words that we're no, no doubt going to hear a little of. May I welcome very much to the microphone Gary Tabor, the theme, Saving Nature at Scale, a Global Perspective. Thank you. Um, it's about one in the morning my time. I literally did get off the plane at, at uh, 12 something today. So you know how they say you could do this in your sleep? So I'm going to sum, sum to ambulate this talk. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, just say thank you for the welcome to country. Um, it means a lot. Um, I represent a different country uh, and, and different peoples. Uh, in this background, this is my backyard. Um, and Divided. Let's see if I can. Uh, now, how will I? Sorry. To go forward, I do this. Yes. Ah, first slide. So, okay. Um, let me give you a general perspective. Um, I look at nature conservation and all that I do in the in the context of planetary thresholds, and we're segmenting creatures. We like to fragment issues, whether it's biodiversity climate change, pollution, um, the way we treat ourselves, um, and we don't look at um, all these
Australia, and still is. The impact of this fragmentation of nature is that we're seeing species on all continents where they have animal movements on land, that's not Antarctica, of where species are moving less than half of what they used to do. Now, if you're moving less, well, you're not um, completing your life cycle, and you're more susceptible to all the um, threats of extinction. And on top of this, every road that you know on the planet, every single paved road, and Bill Lawrence at, at uh, James Cook University has really uh, been the uh, sire. And that that number means one million species that are not interacting, not creating clean water, not creating clean air, not creating the pollination, the services that service not only nature but service ourselves. And when we lose this kind of trophic structure, we're undermining the functions of nature. And the challenge we have is that we are increasing our efforts to conserve nature by creating more and bigger protected areas, but at the same time we're not stemming the tide of the loss of biodiversity. And why is that? Well, let me tell you about the national park that exists in my backyard, an hour from where I live, that's Yellowstone National Park, and you might see a design flaw. This is the first national park created in 1872, and what you see is a box. Now, if you think like a box, and you, this is the way you're going to save nature, these are kind of the perverse impacts you might have. And you think there's a, uh, you know, a kind of a design issue here? Well, nature itself doesn't stay in the box, and these are the migration routes of collared elk in Yellowstone National Park, and I call this the lunch. trying to essentially look outside the boundaries of parks, but still very parochial in our looking. And in the 21st century, in this time of climate change or the Anthropocene, we're in the era of process conservation. How do we conserve the function of nature itself? And what I mean by process conservation is everything from migration 
to dispersal, uh, to pollination, uh, hydrology, water catchment, uh, resilience. It's, it's these, these are the kind of the heartbeat elements of nature. And how do you save this? Well, that's where connectivity conservation comes in. And what is connectivity conservation? It is the conservation that conserves the flows, the movement of species, the dynamic processes that sustains nature and thus sustains us. And this is um, conservation in the 21st century. Let me give you a metaphor. If protected areas, national parks, have been the heart and lungs of saving nature to date, we've done a poor job of saving the circulatory system of nature. And that's what we have to focus on now. And that's what connectivity is. So most of my... Ag. This gets to that nature conservation, by and large, hasn't been done very well outside of protected areas, outside of parks, and in the region called the, what ecologists call the matrix, the human-dominated landscape. We kind of forget that conservation and biodiversity conservation has a very important role in this part of the world, but yet we don't know how to do it very well at all. And for some, this kind of matrix is just the the mixed land use, the mixed jurisdiction for in my backyard for a grizzly bear to kind of traverse between different protected areas that are safe for it to survive, but yet its life history requires it to live and roam between this kind of uh, mixed uh, land use uh, landscape. Or for folks at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development who say that the ag industry itself needs biodiversity to sustain its soils, to sustain pollination, to sustain the productivity for agriculture. And the only way they're going to have to do that is by protecting the connections in nature or protecting connectivity. So when the world's businesses come together and say a call to action for biodiversity and that connectivity is the solution, well, maybe we should take heart. And of course, in a time when we're struggling, how do we respond to these overall impacts of climate change, we know one thing, that if we maintain the connections in nature, we give species the ability to respond to changing environmental conditions. So what's the evidence behind connectivity conservation? Well, for the past two and a half years, um, I've been working with a team of researchers from around the world where we looked at 550 connectivity plans and tried to figure out, well, what works, what doesn't work, we're able to type, create a typology of those plans, and uh, it came up with about 263 plans to determine you know, how effective they are. And what we found is this, is that since 2002, there's been an exponential growth of connectivity work around the world, led by North America, Europe, and Africa. And Australia, which actually has been the home and the hotbed for a lot of the science relating to connectivity conservation, has been a laggard. And that's because one of the reasons is that for success you need enabling legislation. And in other parts of the world where there has been positive responses at state and federal or local governments, you've seen a takeoff of the science and implement it into reality. And that's not been the case. It's been unequal in different parts of the, in different parts of the world. And we were able to categorize nine factors of success. And I won't go through those now. If you want to come to the ESA meeting uh, in about a week's time, I'll give you those nine factors in detail. But what I can say is that there is a bit a lot of work on connectivity using umbrella species or what they call focal species to determine, you know, are they, can they be a proxy for how do you look at connectivity or the function of connectivity on a landscape? And that this science is better when you use a suite of species. And I know, Mena, you've been doing this kind of approach here in Tasmania, and this just proves out over and over again, when you have a suite of species approach, you're better able to approximate all the connective elements in nature. <laughs> 
But let me get back to enabling policy because that seems to be the biggest factor in determining success. And there are countries around the world which are taking leadership. While Australia continues to be a laggard on this, other countries in the world are taking a leadership with regards to connectivity policy or wildlife corridor acts. Um, Costa Rica, Kenya, Tanzania, Bhutan, these are all countries that have made national policy. Canada itself is in the process of creating its own policy through its Target One work. Um, in the next six months, Canada is going to uh, essentially up its game for how much of its uh, lands, lands and seas will be protected, including how much of those protected areas will be connected, because connected areas are, are more effective in saving nature. Even in the challenging time in the Trump administration in the U.S., we're seeing a National Wildlife Corridor Act, and you know that's a proxy for connectivity conservation, go through um, in our House and Senate. And at the more, at subnational scales, U.S. Canadian, U.S. Uh, states and Canadian provinces uh, are working together outside their federal frameworks for cross-border collaboration on this issue, where governors and premiers are working together for uh, connectivity conservation um, um, legislation. We're even seeing designated wildlife corridors at the federal level in the U.S., this one for the pronghorn, and the city of Houston, and I don't know how much you know about urban planning, but probably the worst planned city uh, in the northern hemisphere uh, is Houston, Texas. Um, in fact, it has no planning whatsoever. But yet they are, have a connectivity plan um, for the sprawling city because they know that if this city is to become sustainable, that connectivity is essentially the restoration approach to restoring nature um, in this urban environment. But all this is happening essentially as in, in a reinventing the wheel approach. The left hands and right hands are, are not learning from each other. There's no consistent practice. How do we improve if we don't know how to measure? And that's what this connectivity conservation specialist group that I've been leading is trying to do. First of all, everyone calls connectivity different things you know, from corridors to linkage areas to permeability areas. There's just a babble of, of language um, on the subject. And we have to figure out, well, if we can't even in English talk to each other, how can we talk to each other in other languages? And a lot of people confuse connectivity with their mobile phone coverage. When they think connectivity, it's just whether I'm going to get cell phone coverage or not. But the two worlds came together recently when uh, Russian Raptors, which were fitted with SMS collars, um, wandered into Iran and picked up $500,000 of SMS charges on their mobile phones. <laughs> but let me give you a little bit of background of the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. We're only about um, three years old. We have 800 scientific members in about 80 countries. So we're a science-based, uh, um, volunteer-based entity that serves the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And one of the things we're trying to do, because in 2020, there's going to be new strategic plans for the Convention of Biological Diversity, the Convention of Migratory Species, Ramsar, the Wetlands Convention. All the world's conventions are now gathering together in terms of how do we save nature in a more fragmenting world, in a, moral, in a world more impacted by climate change. And so our group is trying to create the global guidance, the standardization for how do you approach connectivity conservation within this conversation. And so one, we had to define what ecological connectivity is because there was no real definition. And I just came back from Bonn, um, Germany last week at, at the UN where that top line, unimpeded movement of species and flow of natural processes over time and space is the new global definition. We're trying to figure out that the ultimate goal is trying to link up protected areas and these new things called other effective conservation measures. There are lands and seas that are like under Defense Department jurisdiction that conserve biodiversity but are not protected areas. And so nations around the world are saying, well, why can't we include those in our conservation estate? And the world is saying, you can include them as long as protecting biodiversity is their major focus. So we have these patterns on a landscape or seascape, 
and we're trying to connect them into networks. And we had to create something new, or something is a definition called ecological corridors, as the connective piece in this kind of uh, new protected area uh, network. So this schematic is sadly underwhelming um, in the sense that we've created these linear uh, corridors, like hallway corridors, uh, for connectivity. But it only seems to, we just want to make sure that people understand that what we're trying to do is figure out how do you take these patterns that we've created on landscapes and seascapes and add this new designation that supports connectivity through multi-jurisdictional areas that cannot become a protected area, but maintains the function of connectivity and works with working lands, farmers, in support of voluntary agreements to support the connectivity value that serves, um, that essentially makes the, the whole greater than the sum of the parts through these network approaches. And at the same time, we also have to stop the fragmenting functions that, um, that, that are continuing to uh, undermine nature. And so the Connectivity Specialist Group is looking at essentially bringing the green infrastructure thinking that we think about in buildings to roads, because we have a very poor job of looking at roads through a green infrastructure lens. We have to be more innovative in terms of siting, avoiding, mitigating roads. And of course, this all happens in the more complex world of the marine environment. And we have a special group that's just working on marine connectivity because the marine world is a three-dimensional world. So in 2020, and you may see this, maybe you've already seen this in, in popular press, maybe National Geographic, there's a big conversation going on. Is saving more for nature. It's nature needs half. E.O. Wilson is half earth. If you put nature needs half and half earth together, you get a whole earth. Uh, National Geographic has 50% of the world for nature by 2050. Basically, s people are saying we're not saving enough nature to save the planet. And right now, this is the kind of the guidepost, the Convention of Biological Diversity's ACHI Target 11, which says by 2020, at least 17% of land, 12, 10% uh, of marine areas should be protected. A lot of countries have a hard time just getting to this level. And the scientific community says, this is not enough. We need at least 50%. And it has to be well connected. So think about it. If you have these patterns and you're able to connect them, maybe um, in areas where you do not have the big wild, like in the Arctic um, or, or, the, or the boreal forest, you can essentially have the architecture for large-scale conservation. And the other element that I just want to end with with regards to connectivity is that it's not only about connecting lands for connecting lands, but there's a social function. Because in connecting lands, you're connecting people and institution and cultures across jurisdictions. And one quick example in my backyard is Waterton Glacier, International, Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, the first peace park in the world. And Glacier Park is going to be a park without glaciers in the next 15 years because of climate change. And it's a diverse community. And if you're going to save that landscape of 18 million acres, maybe those people and diversity of people who live in that area should, live to, should work together to try to save it. So essentially, we connected all the various interests that surround that landscape and brought them together to figure out how they can work together for a solution. I think this kind of networking at scale is kind of the future, how we're going to address these large scale problems. And you can map, do a social network analysis, and you can map this kind of interaction over time when you bring people together across these kind of landscapes and see the kind of social capital you build. And in the US, you know, um, there are 450. We just did a map, mapping exercise of bringing 450 efforts like this round table uh, together. So it's not just happening in this one, one part, around one park in Montana. It's a happening all over the United States. It's an upwelling of, of, of effort that's bottom up in approach. That's happening not only in North America, it's happening around the world, and we've been mapping it um, globally, both on land and sea. So if you think about it, because some nations and, and certainly governments and are not 
essentially responding to climate change and these, and these large-scale threats. People are taking this matter into their own hands. We could see that in spite of government, we're going to be saving this planet by connecting these, these large landscape and large seascape efforts one at a time. And if you allow me to give one more minute, I always try to figure out how we're going to um, educate or communicate this concept of connectivity to the, to the broader public. Thank you very much, Gary Tabor. That was fantastic and lots of ideas and I'm sure lots of uh, moments to think about for some future questions in our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Tom Dunbabin. Now, as a watcher of agri-politics as a rural reporter and farmer organisations, uh, it's been interesting to see the emergence of strong farmer voices in this sustainable agriculture movement, now often what's termed regenerative agriculture. Think in the early days of Peter Andrews, more recent decades, Charles Massey, as uh, we heard before, Colin Sice, Dr Christine Jones, the soil scientist, Charles Arnott. But here in Tasmania, our own homegrown Tom Dunbabin has been doggedly and practically and intelligently doing it all the way through. Tom hails from the Forestier Peninsula, that beautiful stretch of country between the Dunalley Canal and Eagle Hawk Neck on the Tasman Peninsula. You can read his bio, I won't go through it, but I will mention the fact that in 1996 he received the Nature Conservation National Land Care Award in 2005, the McKell Medal for his land management practices, and just a few weeks ago, he was inducted into the Tasmanian Land Care Roll of Honour for his long-standing and significant contribution to his local land care group. Would you welcome Tom Dunbabin, who's going to present a farmer's perspective on making nature conservation work on farms. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Sally. Um, yeah, big wrap. Just having listened to Gary, I'm not sure how we're going to go with this, but we've gone from the global area to a very local one in Tasmania, in fact, southern Tasmania, really. Um, now, can I get this thing to work? No. Thank you. Help is at hand. Thank you very much. What I um, what I want to talk about is the change in landscape conservation. I guess that we required on farms. How that's going to work? Is it going to work in a local sense? And we're going to be looking at that in the Midlands. A lot of the examples that I'm going to be using are um, from our own property down at Bangor, rather, which is on the east coast. Um, rather than the Midlands. We did have a property at Ross or east of Ross for a few years a while ago, um, a grazing property, but it's, we were lucky enough to be on the edge of the Midlands desert, if you like, so the, um, a lot of the principles that are applying, that need to apply to the Midlands didn't apply to that. This forum 
and the next couple of days' discussion about healthy and productive landscapes is a topical one, not from the perspective of anything new, as the ground is well and truly tilled, but it offers the opportunity of linking the perspectives of a range of interest groups. Most importantly, I hope these perspectives are distilled into some outcomes that are actionable and that it will enhance the landscapes. Healthy, productive landscapes are multifaceted and one of the tasks of this workshop is to unpack those facets. There are, however, two aspects of landscapes that I think are fundamental to developing the concept of healthy and productive. Firstly, our landscapes are not natural. They are cultural artefacts of natural processes, certainly, but they have been heavily, and heavily modified and influenced. The ones that make up just over a quarter of Tasmanian land area are shown here as the browns through, through to the reds. In some areas they are minor and interspersed with treed areas, such as the east coast and along the northeast. For example, whereas others, like the Midlands, they are the predominant landscape. Quick tour of some Midlands landscapes. This is a, dry, a dryland grazing site albeit affected when this picture was taken by a, a, a rainfall deficiency. Dryland pasture from the northern Midlands where rainfall is a little bit higher. Um, an irrigated pasture. And an intensive horticultural site. Cherries in this particular instance using both water and a lot of other inputs. Land use choices, as with pretty much every activity we undertake, are largely about economics and driven in large part by dollars. For ag agricultural land use, the net return per hectare for various enterprises looks something like this. 
focus has been major. It was a dry land grazing sheep and cattle operation and now only sheep with some irrigation and some intensive irrigated horticulture. These rainfall driven changes are common to many farming businesses. Why there's any debate about climate change, I'm buggered if I know. Relatively natural landscapes are changing as well um, as a result of what we do and don't do. These four areas illustrate a consequence of land management change. As an, un an undergraduate re research project at UTAS, Pat Lyons mapped the vegetation change on Cape Frederick Henry, which is part of Bangor on the eastern coast, uh, over a 70 year period. In 1949, 26% of the 160 hectare headland was open woodland and grassland. 70 years later, it's just 0.6%. Historically, the Cape was burned and grazed, but since the imposition of restrictive burning controls and the declining profitability of extension grazing, Alocasurina and Leucopogon shrubs have invaded the grassland. The change is shown here on a, in a similar landscape at nearby Hyatt's Beach. And you can see from that that that's slightly different time, time scale but there's a, been a vast change of, in the ground cover of that um, site and they're all the alocasurinas and the light green ones underneath the, the leucopogons. Historically, um, sorry, the... The Cape is a perpetual con conservation covenant over it now and it is no longer grazed but is, but is it healthier and more productive now than with extensive areas than with the extensive areas of native grassy woodlands that persisted in the past. Changes are also evident in the Midlands. This is a bush block near York Plains. Um, before and after grazing has been excluded Clearly more understory, but there's very little tree recruitment going on over that um, period of time. Midlands again, change here is obvious with a shelter belt pl being planted and establishment quite good. This remnant patch was fenced to exclude grazing and promote understory establishment. The trees are still dying with little recruitment. It's not an encouraging result for the landowner. Compare the growth of that with the growth of the pine shelter belt and the poplars across the road. They're doing quite well. If all this makes you feel a, bit, a little bit disillusioned about the future of rural landscapes, then you will be emboldened by the knowledge that there are factors other than econo economics that drive farmer decision making. The vast majority of farmers have a very strong sense of place, their land. They have a sense of strong sense of responsibility for it and feel passionately about it. And these are very strong drivers of their activities. The other things that drive these actions, knowledge about their land that has been shared with them by others recognition, respect and incentives and the intimate understanding that they have of that land that they manage. If biodiversity protection incentives are to be effective in rural landscapes, they must operate through the concepts of this model by adding to the things in the middle, knowledge, respect, etc. Replacing, with respons replacing responsibility with accountability systems or killing passion with regulation won't enhance actions. They only act as a disincentive. Social, st social stigmatisation by trying to shame and blame for landscape legacies that resulted from past actions, often government policy driven, are equally ineffective. This is an image of Swan Lagoon wetland at Bangor sits adjacent to grazing land, potentially irrigated and possibly cropped. The dune system here is in, very good in a very good natural condition with very few weed species 
and a high vegetation diversity. It was set aside as part of Bangor's informal reserves areas in the 1980s and now has a conservation covenant over it. Its future as a biodiversity hotspot is dependent on the adjoining land supporting viable productive enterprises. In addition to farming at Bangor, there it had the, the, the property supports people services, enterprises that provide useful revenue sources. Families camp at Lagoon Bay under tightly managed conditions to ensure the area isn't overpopulated, providing a natural experience without overly impacting on the environment. Helicopters and light planes ferry in visitors for short time experiences. The wine produced from the vineyard is sold through a cellar door that includes a food experience for visitors. The considered management of Bangor's cultural and natural history and its philosophy is used to promote and enhance that experience. These enterprises occupy a very small part of the property but the experience they provide is underpinned by Bangor's conservation practices. Relatively natural, sorry, um, this is, this, now I've come to the page that I left on the printer at home, so I'm really, I'm really winging it this now. Um, this image, pasture and bushland at Bangor, illustrates what I see as the challenge of maintaining health and productive landscapes. It's the one that was on the first slide, in the long term. It shows a mixture of pasture, native and sown, forest, logged and conserved, and a small plantation. Tasmania had a whole farm planning program that was widely promoted and resourced in the 80s and 90s and the uptake by almost 50% of farmers. It may seem to be simplistic, but many adopted land management changes that were positive for biodiversity. In, in answer to the question at the start, yes, I do believe farming landscapes can conserve nature. And I certainly hope I'm correct, as if not, biodiversity is in for a huge hit. However, there are some criteria around that. It's got to be economic for the land manager. It needs to fit within his, sense of his and her sense of place of what their land is. It also needs to sit within the skill set of the land manager and to fit within the farming systems that they operate. Radical change rarely achieves long-term sustainable change. And it's got to be tailored to each and every farm situation. So just to conclude, I think it's a, there, is a, there is a role for, for nature conservation on, on um, private farmland. The Midlands is going to be a bit of a test for this because it's probably of all the areas in Tasmania it's got the most miles to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Tom. That's a very big land scale project, a farm that size. Um, now Tom, I should say Ted, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to cut your uh, introduction just a little bit short just for the interests of time so we can squeeze in the maximum number of questions. So I'm going to cut to the chase. You can read Ted, uh, uh, Professor Ted Lafroy's bio on the page but I will just say that Ted is currently Associate Head of Research with the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture. His research interest is in the integration of biophysical and social research to solve problems in environmental management and policy with a particular emphasis on the environmental impacts of agriculture. Professor Ted Lefroy, thank you very much and come up to this microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Sally, <clears throat> and thank you very much, Minna and Caroline, for the invitation to speak. Um, given the breadth of the topic, I thought the best entry point was the very useful set of questions that Minna and Caroline put 
on the back of the flyer. If you haven't seen it, there they are. <clears throat> and what I'm proposing to do is to answer those because I think reading through those, they triggered a lot of responses in me as to how we go about uh, addressing what is a very broad and complex issue. And I want to start with the first two because the first thing that struck me is who is the we in that sentence? Who is saying that? <clears throat> is this the, the, the voice of actors in the middle of the landscape? Is it barrackers on the edge? Is it local, state or federal government? Are there commercial interests, commodity traders, processors? The point I'm making is that there is no one person or one group of people that manages a landscape. Uh, it, it, it's agricultural landscape ranging from thousands to tens of thousands of hectares uh, are in one sense managed by hundreds of small businesses called farms within the rules and regulations set down by three layers of government at the mercy of markets and weather. Uh, and so what we've got is a very loose sort of cooperation. And social scientists tell us that this sort of what they call collaborative governance in the broader sense works best where there is a diversity of interests, there is an independence of interests, and there is authentic dialogue. So if you have one group of people who dominate, who re represent one interest, either agricultural or ecological, it's unlikely to be a sustainable or productive form of collaborative governance. If they rely on each other and there is some form of authentic dialogue, it's more likely. Um, and so to the answer to the question, who are we? I want to go back to an attempt that some of us made a few years ago uh, about six years ago, we, we uh, got a research contract from the federal government to ask the question, how do we manage biodiversity at the scale of regions and landscapes? And the origin of that question, which, which would then triggered this large project, was a review of, our, of Australia's principal environmental legislation, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It was first passed in 1999 when it reached its 10th, birth, 10th birthday, they reviewed it. And the review came back with a recommendation that at the moment it is limited because it focuses on species and communities. And what it needs to do is also look at processes that occur at the scale of landscapes and regions. <clears throat> and what we did is assemble a group of about 30 researchers, roughly seven dis different disciplinary groups, wildlife ecologists, fire ecologists, freshwater ecologists, climate scientists, geographers, economists, social scientists. And we chose two very contra contrasting landscapes to ask that question. One was the Midlands as what is essentially a privately owned valley. And the other was the Australian Alps, which covers four jurisdictions and is essentially a publicly owned mountain range. We thought these are two quite extremely different landscapes. If we pose the same question in them, does that help us answer the question, how do you go about conserving biodiversity at that scale? And that group of 30, we met twice a year. Uh, we were sort of let loose in the separate disciplinary groups. But about halfway through, when we uh, came back together to check on progress, we posed the question, can you please write down every study that you've undertaken to investigate the question of what are the natural values in that landscape and how is the best way to conserve them? Write down every study you think that will result in a publication because we know the currency of all the researchers is they need to publish something. So we thought that would be a way of finding out what it is they're doing, what they thought was germane to that question. And we had about 60 up on a wall and then we sorted these into categories. And, and what appeared to us was a logical sort of sequence of questions. And that is, firstly, we had to understand the social contract, context. Who lives there? What do they do? What do they value? They're most likely, as Tom said, to have the most intimate knowledge of that landscape. So we start with that social context. The next was to say, what are the natural values? And not only those that are legally protected, but those that are recognised by the people that live there. And you can see that sequence there. And if everything works well, I'll take you to the... OK, so th this was the way we submitted our final report to the federal government. And there is our checklist. And I just wanted to give you an idea that why we started with people in place. 
So it was, you, you can see just by the titles of those publications the sort of questions we ask. What was the social profile of the people that lived there? What do they do? What were the trends? What were the demographics? So the point I'm really making is it's critical we know who is asking that question. Who are the we in, in that question? How do we envisage a future landscape? And how do we get there? Uh, what am I doing now? No, I'm leaving that. I'm getting out of that. Um, okay, so I'll come back to that in a minute because there's another question which is absolutely central to that question of who we are and that was the one about constraints and how do we overcome them. But the, the third question that, that Mena and Caroline posed is what can we learn from Aboriginal land practices? Uh, and over the last decade we've seen a range of books, including these, three of these in the last five years, which have really opened the eyes of most Australians to the way that the Australian landscape was managed. And I've just put three themes there, fire, mobility and law, and they didn't occur to me by reading those books. Where it struck me was watching uh, an ABC program, Landline, every Sunday at 12.30. There's a one-hour mini-documentary about rural Australia. And on the 12th of August last year, they profiled five farms in the middle of the worst drought experienced in New South Wales that were doing pretty well. And what fascinated me was, and that's where these themes came from, was realising what those five, what was similar across those five different farm families. One was in good years, they had bought land away from the home farm. So they had spread their risk. They had diversified the particular landscape they were dependent on. Another, where I've got law, I'm thinking of cultural law in, in, in terms of Aboriginal land management, the equivalent is a new set of norms. And the, the common norm amongst these five was they managed for soil and plants more than animals. In other words, they watched the condition of the soil and the plants. And when ground cover was reduced below a certain level, they adjusted their, their animals, they sold them or they moved them to another block. But they didn't manage their farm on the condition of the animal but the condition of the soil and the plants. And that struck me as a social norm that we have yet to accept uh, in Australia generally. If we see bare soil on television when there's a, a story about drought, our reaction should be that that, that contravenes a fundamental social norm. That, that, that is not acceptable land management. Um, all the consequences that follow in terms of soil erosion and, and essentially processes such as water and nutrient cycling, instead of become cycles, become flows. So it struck me that there was a kind of indigenous wisdom that was emerging amongst those, which resonated with the few common elements you can look at that diverse range of books and if you were to read one of, one of those, I'd start with Dark Emu, the one on the left. It's a very slim volume. It's a fascinating insight into what has been hiding in plain sight in the journals of explorers and government officials when they first observed the state of the Australian continent and what they saw, which has not been in our history books and should be. So the thing we still have to come to terms with is fire. Uh, with all our infrastructure and our sedentary lifestyle, we are still struggling with fire, but there is much to learn from the way that Aboriginal people manage fire. But the idea of mobility and law, I think, are things we can adopt. Mobility, in the Aboriginal sense, was, uh, as Rob Anders described, the different nations, and if you read Lyndall Ryan's book, The Tasmanian Aborigines, you get a very clear picture of movement of people, even between nations and within nations, following different seasonal foods. Okay, so the fourth question, how can, we, how can regenerative agriculture practices help? Well, it comes to, to Gary's point when he said 21st century conservation is about processes. And I'd say the answer here is by, by focusing on processes as well as things. And if I was to summarise in a very simple sense what's the essence of regenerative agriculture, it's improving nutrient and water cycling and carbon sequestration through biodiversity being the means to the end, but the end is improving nutrient cycling, water cycling and carbon sequestration. The end result ideally is increased productivity, that's production per unit uh, input, profitability and reduced risk. You end up with usually a lower input, lower output system, less variation, 
lower risk. Um, but the ultimate aim is to improve the well-being of farming communities, farming families and their communities. But, the, the, but there is a common element in what we uh, came up with in our study in terms of these principles. And if I just take you to the second one, what we called was to take a much broader view of natural landscapes, uh, of, sorry, natural processes. So in a legal sense, you stick to the green box. What are the statutory biodiversity features? The, the EBPC Act, the Environmental Protection of Biodiversity Act, lists species and communities that are threatened and endangered. And once they reach that status, it triggers a series of formal actions, recovery plans, investment. What the review found in 2009 was that there are 1,400 roughly species on that list and since the Act was passed, all they had done is grown. So concentrating at the scale of those legally protected threatened species and communities wasn't helping. And so what, what is added to this is, a, is another range of, of, of features, um, which includes connectivity, you can see the fifth box down, but also common but very important, structurally important plant species and common but very important highly interactive animal species. So it, it gets away from the idea that only the rare and the endemic is useful. They all have a role to play and the focus is on processes as well as things. So th I think there's a common element in both biodiversity conservation at scale and regenerative agriculture is the focus on process. Um, what are the constraints? They're very specific and the reason they're very specific was, uh, and I won't go back to the website, I'll just show you what came out of a piece of scenario planning we did in the Midlands. Scenario planning is an exercise where you look at plausible futures. You don't try and predict, but, you, but if you, you look at plausible futures and the way you approach it is by asking, if our goal is to improve biodiversity lands, uh, conservation in that landscape, what are the major drivers? And so what we assembled was a group of people and we attempted to cover that wide range of people I was talking about in, in my first response, so landholders, government, uh, ecologists, people from commerce and industry, and we asked them what are the major drivers and then we asked them to rank them in terms of their importance and their uncertainty. Now climate change was important but it wasn't uncertain. Uh, nobody saw that as being an uncertain driver. The ones that came out on the top right when we plotted them in, on, on two axes of importance and uncertainty were farmer profitability and social and human capital. Without discretionary income, farmers aren't going to invest a lot in conservation. If farming is not profitable in that landscape, then those hundreds of small businesses that effectively manage the landscape are not able to do it. And you can see there, if you combine high and low extremes of farmer profitability and social and human capital, we came up with four scenarios. Now, the idea of coming up with the four scenarios is you say, it's a way of stress testing any strategy or plan. What would happen under each of those? Could you survive under each of those? What would your strategy be? It's not a case of aiming for any of them, but saying, what would we do under them? And I might just quickly, if I can, show you one exercise that one group did, which I thought was quite creative. They found a way of mapping each of those different scenarios. Um, so this is work by Oberon Carter and his colleagues from the Department of Primary Industries. Um, and there you can see in those little images, I should explain that weird shape. That's another legal or legislative instrument. That's the Midlands Biodiversity Bioregion as ordained by the Commonwealth. It isn't, it, it, it's better than Gary's box, but not a lot better because it, it cuts out a very odd little bit of land, which is mainly the, the valley of the Macquarie River and the Fingal River going off to the right. Um, and so what they did is by taking the text of those scenarios that were developed by that group of people from the Midlands and converting each sentence of that text into GIS rules or mapping rules, they then said, well, look, that's what potentially each of those scenarios might look like. And the question was then, what's the fate of conservation under those? And so I come to the final one. Now, I, I was very interested to hear Gary say the most significant factor was policy in driving connectivity. Maybe it's symptomatic of the fact that Australia is such a laggard that my reaction is don't wait for government. What we've seen in Australia in the last 30 years is the phenomenal growth of the not-for-profit uh, sector and their role in conservation. And just a few quick graphs of trends 
this is in the United States, but they're being mirrored in Australia, uh, is trends within uh, what is increasingly being called the for-purpose for or not-for-profit sector, is even though environment, you can see, is, is, comes last in that list of the different categories of, of giving and bequests, it is growing, and largely at the expense of religious organisations, but it has an awfully long way to go. And, and here I need to declare, uh, a, a, it's not a conflict of interest, but it's an interest. I'm on the board of, of a not-for-profit uh, that started 15 years ago with $150 and now manages 30,000 hectares of nature reserves. And one of the key features is their location and how to put them in such a way that they do create the connectivity that Gary was talking about. It's phenomenal to think that a community can support an organisation to that extent, to go from $150 to tens of millions of dollars worth of assets uh, managed by such a small group of people. And I think that is where we've put a lot of hope in Australia. I take Gary's point that if we had policy that guided that, that growth would be even rap more rapid. But I think in Australia, we've recognised that governments have deserted the field and people are doing it for themselves. So there is my response to those questions and I thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted Lafroy. Now, I might just get uh, the speakers to grab a chair. We'll just do a little rearranging so that we can have you out the front. We'll have 10 minutes for some questions from the floor. So, um, Tom, do you mind coming back out under the spotlight again? And grabbing the now, we have some microphones and um, I'm hoping that um, there'll be some thought-provoking questions that might come from the floor. And if someone was able to take a microphone and um, when you in ask the question, you could just say your name um, and uh, the question. So are you going to be able to take the microphone? Thank you. So to be, uh, we, have a, we have a raised hand. Yes, hello. Do you want to just grab that uh, microphone so that everybody can hear? Thank you. If you could just tell your name and the question. Um, my name's Neil Davidson. Um, thank you for some great talks. I really enjoyed it. And I'd like to start with asking Tom, uh, given that you see enormous variations in the value of various parts of your land from $500 a hectare for rough grazing country to 10000 for irrigated cropping, um, is there not a possibility that you can earn enough money out of the land which is profitable to then provide areas which are for conservation outside that? Um, I, th I think what you're saying is, do you expect the landowners to shift their income from a profitable operation to support a non-profitable one? Is that the thrust of it? Yes. I mean, given, given that, that there is support for, often irrigation, um, the water is supplied, supplied to farmers in the middle end, Midlands down the major river systems to provide extra resources for cropping, then there should one would think that might be more flexibility within the farmer's range of activities to include conservation as a higher proportion. Well, the reality is that that that's not going to happen, um, in my view, unless they can see a benefit from doing that conservation. On a purely economic argument, it's, it's going to go nowhere. But if you start building in all those other things that I've talked about, yes, it's probably it's going to have leaks. But they're not doing it as a philanthropic donation from one section of their operation to another. They're doing it for a whole bunch of other reasons. As a... I mean, you have a great sense of place, a sense of concern for your land, and the, the balance between those two activities would, would not drive you to be um, more concerned about the natural component? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're meaning, but if you, see, I mean, we the, the conservation practices at, at Bangor have been in play for a couple of three generations, so it's always been a principle of using resources to their best advantage without using the environment, using the resources you've got without modifying them, and 
For example, at one stage when my grandfather was farming during the depressions in the 1930s, he, his check from um, wallaby and possum skins was higher than his wool check. So he was going to be looking after the whole lot, wasn't he, during that period. Um, he was also looking after his sheep, of course. But the point is that um, you've still got to have an economic return. There's still got to be a reason for, for doing it. And if conservation can enhance other areas of your business, such as the, the, the wine operation that I talked about at Bengal, it's going to happen. But in terms of a direct... The thinking is not going to be, OK, I'm making $10,000 there. I'm going to just shift the money and and support a non, non-profitable part of the business that's not going to make any money. That's not going to happen. But if there are other reasons for supporting that business, yes, it will happen. Um, and any other questions? Thank you, Neil. Um, Neil's part of Greening Australia, which is doing some fabulous work in the in the Midlands. Yes, Mena, down the front. I'd like to follow directly on from Neil's question because there is a an academic exercise about called land sparing and sharing, that um, land sparing, where you intensify land use in some areas and put aside land for nature in others, the majority of species on Earth do better under that scenario because about 80% of them are specialists. The land sharing, which is what we call wildlife friendly farming, actually uh, puts most species on Earth at, um, at risk or at a disadvantage. But what Tom's described there is that that's not, you know, that is an academic exercise. It's not how farmers think. So what are the kind of hooks or levers or incentives that farmers will respond to to put aside um, land for nature conservation on their properties? Well, I just got on that one of those slides that I had up there. It was about the tapping into the passion and the respect and the, all that social side of, of land management that, 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 they, that they know and understand um, and that they feel rewarded just as everybody else does, for, um, whether you're a high-performing sportsman or whether you're a high-performing academic. They're the things that pull your strings. Um, so, and the ex- farmers are exactly the same. So there's all of that side of it and that's, you know, that's, they're the things that are going to make the difference. The point that I'm making with Neil is that just talking about it in economic terms is not going to cut it. It's not going to happen in that. You, just for economic reasons because they're not economic reasons for doing it. So, um, profitability overall, it's going to be for, um, I've always been of the view that Money doesn't um, enable you to do things, but lack of it stops you. So if a business, the main business that they're running is not profitable, they haven't got the means to do the other things. But just because they're making a profit on their uh, main business doesn't mean that they're going to spend money on the other side. Um, Some of the largest landowners in the Midlands um, do the least amount of conservation works. and, but, but they are highly profitable. Um, I might uh, put a question to Ted and also to Gary. It might sort of uh, be a shared uh, question here, and that is that I really was moved by that illustration you had of all the, the pie chart and the overlapping areas because this has to be a, a networked activity. But the question really is, do we actually know what the landscape is that we want to get to? Do we have the science, the knowledge for that? And then are we collaborating with all the various organisations and groups to get to that point? So as a journalist, I'm never allowed to ask double barrel questions, but I'm no longer a journalist, so I can pose it to you. So the first question is, do we know what the landscape is that we want to get to? And then are we collaborating to get to that point? I think the first thing is that the, the question of what we want is not a question of science, but a question of values. And it goes to my first point there, is you've got to first decide, who are we? Um, who, has, who has a say in that? And which is why I think the point about collaborative governance is if you don't have a wide diversity of interests of all the people who do have an interest in a landscape, and if those interests are not independent, 
you're not going to get an answer that's meaningful. I, I know that doesn't really, <laughs> it's not really helpful, but what's really struck us about that project that I was talking about is how difficult it was to describe who we were and what we wanted. And until you, describe, until you define that, you, you can use science to get there once you define that, but if, if it's a minority or a subsection who defines it, it's never going to stick. But Gary, I'll now give you the correct answer. <laughs> I don't know. You guys have been doing so well. Why do I have to answer? Um, so first of all, I mean, the future desire. First of all, what we know we don't want. We have to stop clearing the nature that we have. There is no return point if we just continue to lose. So that has to stop. That's a desired condition. You know, and then the question is, how do we build back nature in a way that supports human livelihoods? And I think that's going to be the grand experiment that all of us are going to be practicing because that now includes carbon sequestration. It's not just having more species alone. It has to be done in the context of how are we going to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And I think private landowners, the small businesses, that Ted talk about and Tom work are essentially our future. And the conversation today is how do we enlist the land stewards, uh, n not only in the Midlands but around the world, to essentially um, be the tip of the sphere of, of bringing this planet back because the vital signs, if you're looking at this from a, you know, a health standpoint, the monitors are reading low, and the life support is coming fast, and we need to improve our practice. And then improving our practice, we can get, to hopefully, to a place where we can um, say that um, we're achieving a level of health, because right now, the desire right now is to improve the health of both the land and the planet. So thank you for that. I'll ask one more question. Oh, there's two questions. Oh, three questions. They're all rushing. I think we'll um, see how we might take those three and then wind it up because we're sort of running out of time. But let's go to Louise with the black and white check shirt and then Pete and then oh, we've got, I'm going to go for three. So maybe whoever was there, that one there. Hi. <laughs> thank you. That was, that was great hearing from the three of you. Um, you all touched in various ways on the role of legislation and regulation. Um, Ted particularly mentioned the previous review of our national environmental legislation, the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, and how uh, there was a recommendation in 2009 that we include processes, and Gary talked about a global movement of trying to include connectivity conservation into regulatory sort of frameworks. And we've just had the um, Federal Environment Minister announce uh, at the end of October that we're going to undertake a regulatory review of our national EPBC um, Act. And so I'm just wondering what the three of you, with your different perspectives, think about um, the potential of those sort of processes and review processes to achieve some of those goals. Uh, I have the mic quickly. I don't know the particulars of the legislation here in Australia, I do know that um, when we talk about policy and regulations, we, we look at them as rule-based of what you can't do and can do versus incentive-based. And so when I was looking or talking about policy in my talk and looking at connectivity, I think there's a, a movement to figure out how do we facilitate incentive-based policy that supports risk-taking and, uh, um, and certain um, progressive type of practices um, with regards to you know, the land uses we've talked about in, in, the, in this session. Uh, <clears throat> little to none. <laughs> And I say that because of the current mood, not only in Australia but of this government. We've, the current government, we had the Minister for Environment enabling the Minister for en en Energy flagrantly breaching the EBPC Act recently to no consequence. Uh, I, I'm very suspicious about why they want another review 
We're now 10 years after the 2009 review and most of those recommendations have not been implemented. Does that answer your question, Louise? Oh, well, I'll, I can give you a practical example. The neighbour that was near us to a block that we had up at Ross, um, there was a threat of um, grassland um, controls on managing grasslands and the, his response was to cultivate every potential dam site that he had on his property. So we're going to go, uh, Pete, I think you were, oh, well, okay, go up to the next one. We're going to have to do four now because we're going to be, Pete, we'll come back to you afterwards, then the lady in the yellow shirt, mustard shirt. Um, look, thanks for that. I'm, I've got a very quick question. I appreciate um, the talks that you've given and particularly the questions that Ted posed. Um, I was particularly interested in the one about how can we learn from Aboriginal land practices and how do we incorporate these and return Aboriginal people to their country? And I suppose one of the things that I see as an elephant in the room is the way that we as, um, as we are here, we sort of are land owners rather than land custodians and often we take the attitude of adding value to the monetary value to our land in order to pass it on to our next generations but if we shifted the focus to being custodians, could that perhaps change the way we manage the land? Anyone in particular that you're addressing well, the question? So, yeah, to? I guess the question, I suppose, it's more, that was a comment. I guess my question is how do we return Aboriginal people to their country? That was probably the fundamental question. I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. Sorry, the question is how do we return Aboriginal people to their country when we have a system which we have ownership as to the way we um, have land? Um, you, does anyone feel comfortable to tackle that? Yeah, I'm going to answer it in a roundabout way. I think what we can return is Aboriginal wisdom. Um, in a sense, I mean, okay, we the invaders have been here 200 years. Aboriginal people have been here 50,000 years. We are very slowly and in the early stages becoming native to this place, eventually. The best we could do is to take, I think, the, the, the wisdom of Aboriginal land management and incorporate them into the way we manage land. And I think the four books I described <clears throat> and those very simple but, but challenging principles of, of managing fire and having a greater sense of, of mobility rather than fixedness and a new set of cultural norms about what is and what is not acceptable land management, I, I think if we embrace those, it's a start. It doesn't, it doesn't specifically answer your question in the present day, but I think that's the way it happens. We become that. Rob, did you have anything you wanted to add to that very quickly? Uh, sorry, Rob, sorry, Rob. You want to come over here and get on the microphone so everyone can hear? Sorry? Did you want to put it, get on the microphone? <laughs> Thank you. I suppose I'd turn around and say that um, it'd be good to become back to the landowner or custodian because that's the, the model one to get um, our people back onto country and to be able to look after it. And when um, I was at a, a meeting, heads of agency meeting on Monday with government and a number of Aboriginal organisations and just hearing the story about one of the organisations and how they employ 60 people and they started off in the process 20 years ago and they've got uh, farms, a number of businesses and their whole ethos is all around um, giving back to the community and supporting that community as opposed to thinking about um, you know, necessarily export markets and um, you know, one, one trend that we're seeing is the selling of farms to overseas interests that now. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. just because of time, we'll have two of these two questions. There's the lady with the mustard shirt and Pete on the end there. So that's it. Thank you. You, you actually sort of answered my question in the last slide, so I'll try and reframe it. But the point, I think, just to make sure we have this clear is that, so I'm a social scientist and one of um, Ted's accolades, um, and 
that it's, it's about interdependence of interest, not independence of interest, just in case people heard that wrong. But the thing that we are trying to achieve in part of this discussion is interdependence as a process, right, rather than um, a, pro a product or object-oriented thinking. But it's very easy to put your, your polar bear on the front of a product or a bear, you know, these iconic objects. But how do you get process? And especially, you know, wisdom into into the market um, to make these things valuable, or, or is or do we give up on markets as well? <laughs> is it all social? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I put you the mic between you and your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Has it fallen between the cracks, that, that no, question? No, no. It's, it's, Just it, thinking it's, about it's, it. You know, it's, it's so profoundly wise, it's hard to answer. I mean, that's, I mean in, in a true sense, you're absolutely correct. And so it's like when you, when you hear a truth, you know, all I can say is I, I affirm, you know, your, your tenet of thinking. Um, I, I wonder if it doesn't take a crisis for humans to challenge their values. I'm trying to think of the quote, and who said it? It was, it was I, I, I think it was Aldo Leopold, but it's something like human history is a series of journeys out from a, a starting point in search of a set of values and we come back to the same point time and time again. Uh, and sadly, it, it would appear to be it takes a crisis before we come out of our complacency and challenge our values. There you go. That's helpful. Pete, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, lady there with the... Uh, we'll just get... Yep. Hi. Um, I'm going to ask a question or two and then I'll throw in some context as where I'm coming from because of this... F for asking this question. And the question is, where to now? And... How can we make it work? And I'll give you now give you context. In the late seventies, I went to Ag College, and one of the things I remember from Ag College is a lecturer putting on ABBA, going money, 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 and his comment was, "Farmers can't be green if they're in the red." So again, late seventies. Got married into a multi generational family on the on um, a large property in the eighties droughts, fun and games then moved into what was then called holistic grazing, um, time control grazing, had Christine Jones come to our place to try and do some um, research on our place, except there wasn't enough rain, it literally stopped raining as soon as she set up her plots. Um, but when it did start to rain, we saw the benefit of a, a what was called time control hol grazing, holistic management. Now, seems to be under an, a bit wider umbrella of regenerative agriculture culture. So as you do, things go bad, you leave the farm, you leave the marriage. Ended up in Canberra going to um, ANU and doing resources and environmental management and policy and fire and all of the things that you do when you're passionate about land management and then working in a very good federal government environmental stewardship program where farmers were um, funded for 10 to 15 years for land management. So these are all things that have happened in the past. I thank you for bringing all this stuff together, even though it's got different names, but I will disagree on what to me are personal and passionate fundamentals. There are many farmers that I know and have seen who are very, very good, intuitive and learned farm managers who are custodians of the land, but they don't necessarily want to be seen as that. They just want to get on with it and they want to hand on the land in a better condition to their children. Um, and many of them have learned from the blackfellas, if I can say that in this modern age, um, because they're and on the is, edges and they've have worked with Aboriginal people. Is there a question? People. The question was where to now? This has been coming for a long time. We have had this knowledge of so much for a long time. How do we get that bigger uptake? when it's a wicked problem and if we want to preserve biodiversity and get better land, better wa water cycling and better communities, how do we preserve or encourage biodiversity in ideas, the broad range of land managers are out there 
knowing that we can never all come to the one right answer because there is not one right answer. So uh, I'll start with the where to now. So the trends, urbanization, people are leaving the farms and going to cities. Children do not want to do farming like their parents or grandparents have done, so they're leaving the profession. Um, you know, are we, are we talking about, uh, you know, a species of, of human endeavor going extinct here because, you know, the, the, just the, e the transition of, a, of an enterprise is going from the small farm to industrial farming. I think, you know, there are trends going on that, that are um, challenges to, the, to, the, to your question. Yeah, that it, I guess that there's, a, there's a couple of, there's a, well, there's a whole bunch of things mixed up in what you're asking there, but one of the things is that I think the, the agribusiness push or the trend towards large agribusiness production of food and fibre is, is going to have its day. Um, I've only seen stuff published recently where Family farms are much, much more productive and can do things at a much lower cost than big agribusiness. They don't have a bureaucracy support for a start. Um, they feed one, but they don't support it themselves. Um, so there's all those sorts of issues involved. But the main, the main one is, I think, you know, I only put those economic numbers up there to, to show you the scale of the issue. I didn't put it up there as a definitive statement of what's going to happen. And um, I tried to illustrate it by saying that you know people are not doing what they do just for money. Um, a lot of people do. But having said that, I, at our field day the other day, I was talking to a guy about rotational grazing, and he said, "Rotational grazing, you've got to put up all those fences. There's no way I can pay money putting those bloody fences up." So that's the mentality that we're at with a lot of people, with some people. So that's the reality of where we're at, and. Unless we can address the whole gamut of realities, we're, we're not going to make enough change. To me, the most encouraging thing is what we can see evidence of the evolution of values. I mean, there's a very slim little book, it's nearly 30 years old, called The Rights of Nature by Roderick Nash, and in it he charts the devolution of rights from a small group of landowning nobles in Britain through the Magna Carta right through to Peter Singer's book animal liberation, through to the recognition of the rights of, I've forgotten the name of the river in New Zealand, uh, a forest, you, you would know this in South America. So the idea that nature has standing and has legal right. Now, that may seem like a slow process, but when you look at the history, it is an inevitable, it seems to be an inevitable progression. Uh, maybe uh, I'm, I'm um, being overly optimistic, but when I see that trend and I see evidence of it around now, uh, you know, it's not science or rhetoric that is going to drive it, it's a change in values. I was talking to a farmer I've known for 50 years the other day and as we got onto the subject of, you know, the weather and how's everything, I was expecting the usual lament, you know, the listening. And, I, and we got onto the subject of glyphosate, Roundup, and the fact that it's about to be banned in Europe and it's, and it's likely, w whether it's for good scientific reasons or not, it's very likely that it's going to be more and more problematic to use. And I said, what do you think of that? And he said, I think it'd be great. Price of food would go up. We would be better off. He's accepting that society is demanding things of him and he can see over the horizon to that being good. So I think it's this, I'm encouraged by what I see as the evolution of values and values is going to drive that change. Uh, have we got time? You know, a lot of people say, oh, we haven't, haven't got time, we've got to rush. Uh, what's that saying, that patriotism is the refuge of the scoundrel? You know, urgency is the refuge of the scoundrel as well. Yeah, really. That's so, it, exactly. So, I'll, I'll end on that note, which is, might, might sound wildly optimistic but, and, and require enormous patience, especially how the world is to now. But I'd encourage you to read, read that book by Roderick Nash. You would know it. It's, yes. a, it's a beautiful little book. And the cover is a picture of a Tasmanian forest. There you go. Peppered with wonderful quotes. Thank you, Ted. Look, uh, that's our presentation and questions for tonight. Would I, could I ask you to put your hands together to thank our guests, Professor Ted LaFoy, <laughs> Gary Tabor, Tom 
Tom Dunbabin and Rob Anders as well. Thank you very much. And uh, Mena, I think, is going to come and uh, just tell us a little bit about what that fragrance is that's wafting into, our, into the, um, the room is from and what it's about. Thank you, Mena. Well, I'll ask uh, the speakers to come up. Thank you very, very kindly. And um, that wonderful smell out there is pizza. Um, you probably can't smell the beer or the soft drinks or fruit juice, but that's there as well. So um, I won't take up much more time except to thank our speakers. And um, Gary's actually hosted uh, at his house in Bozeman, Louise Gilfeder, Leon Barmuta and myself. <laughs> I was over there two years ago on a Fulbright. And so over the next couple of days, we're going to ply Gary with quite a, a lot of lovely Tasmanian wine, but I figured he was going to get on an aeroplane and might have really not want to be carrying bottles of wine around with him. So I've got some compulsory reading, which he might want to read by tomorrow. Um, I hope he hasn't read these books, but um, uh, they, they've all been mentioned in this session. <laughs> if, if not by tomorrow, then maybe they'll make good reading for the plane on the way back. So thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, for our other two speakers, Tom, would you like to come out and say thank you very much for making the trek into town? and uh, coming and sharing your wisdom with us. And Ted, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and trekking short distance down the hill. <laughs> and enjoy the wine. And I will also extend a very big thank you to Rob, who at quite short notice um, has given us a, a wonderful, not just a, wel a welcome to country, but actually some really valuable insights into Aboriginal um, wisdom. Thank you. So, <laughs> let's go and eat. <laughs>